So uh, it's my hope that these five, um, these five talks will all interlock. And uh, if you miss one uh, in the electronic age, it doesn't matter because they're you know, taping it in audio and video. So uh, you can always get it later. But what I was trying to set up last time was a model for the evolution of consciousness, <coughs> taking uh, Buddha's five skandhas and the biology of the unfoldment from the spirochete to the, to the spinal cord as a model of the biology of consciousness. And now what I want to do uh, is not just embed consciousness in the physiology of, the, of, of perception and consciousness, but also try to embed it in, in cultural ecologies and to show a different kind of narrative for uh, the same story that Rick is telling in The Passion of the Western Mind, to tell the story of the unfoldment of our civilization, but looking at it from the point of view of not so much the intellectual history of ideas, but uh, a, a more biologically based uh, philosophy of cultural ecology. So what Lindisfarne has been as an intellectual chamber music ensemble, as an alternative to MIT, was trying to find uh, those thinkers who were performing the planetary culture and bringing together different ways of looking at it rather than simply the technological reductionist. So I was attracted to people like Gregory Bateson and Lynn Margulis and uh, Jim Lovelock and Francisco Varela and, and uh, Stuart Kaufman and people like that. So Lindisfarne as a school of thought really is very much a biologically based school of philosophy. Even though I'm actually not a scientist or a mathematician but am basically a writer and started out and still hope I am uh, a poet. So my uh, interest in scientists was to uh, find cosmological material from them that uh, that could, with just a, a slight exercise of the imagination, be made to sing. And so I was much more inspired by my association with scientists than by my, my friendship with poets. Uh, and I actually got turned off to the whole poetry scene in Cornell, where I found it just vain and, hey, mommy, look at me, and, and competitive. And I just said, away you know, from this. So I, I ran away from poetry in Cornell and, and ran into writing essays and history and, and tried to get away from literary culture. And so my life's been spent in scientific culture. But it's basically not science, because I'm a complete fraud in science. I'm, I'm totally a humanist. So what I want to do is introduce the concept of cultural ecology. And I want to come at it in a slightly heretical way, and uh, especially a place so deeply committed as this institute is to the notion of deep ecology, by basically uh, making one sort of thesis statement that there is no such thing as nature, and that nature is the horizon of culture and that as you change cultures, you change your consciousness of nature. And this notion that there is a pure nature that is out there uh, that can be achieved through various systems of human purification uh, or, or refinement, I think is a, is a false notion, that culture and nature are inseparably linked. And you can no more uh, be unnatural than you can jump over your shadow. We're deeply embedded. In the, uh, in the universe. And so when we say nature, that's a construct. Uh, nature, if Descartes will say, I see by the light of nature that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equals 180 degrees. Dr. Johnson will use the same word nature, and he'll mean just sort of the collective common sense of, of uh, Western civilization. Wordsworth will say the return to nature and have a whole image of uh, nature as a, an invaluating landscape that uh, uplifts the soul from the fallenness of life in the city. Part of what we've inherited from Wordsworth and Constable is a kind of Sierra Club image of nature that is the sort of the, the pure landscape. But that, that, those calendars that we buy from Sierra Club, they owe a great deal to Gainsborough and Constable. They're, an art, they're, a, they're a cultural construct. And I think in some sense, deep ecology is the flip side of 19th century materialism. In the 19th century, you had the notion that there was physics and there was nature, and if you could subtract the impurity of human emotion and achieve precise measurements, you would achieve natural truth, and that the human was somehow a contamination, and the machines were more trustworthy to register the precise measurement than just the sensorium <coughs> uh, that was bringing forth the kind of history of uh, our embeddedness in uh, natural evolution. So the flip side of that is that nature's out there, and it's pure, and if you keep the people out of the, the parks, and if you keep people away from polluting, and if you keep people away from culture, you'll have nature in all its deep ecological purity. And I think that's a fiction. That's a, that's a construct. It's a cultural notion that's an emotional response to the condition of our you know, polluted biosphere. 
But what we have to, if we are to truly survive, is we never can subtract ourselves from the biosphere. We have to learn to have this metanoia, this shift, where we begin to understand that pollution is misinformation, that evil is the enunciation of the next level of emergent order. And if we really understand the double linking of culture and nature, then a radically different culture is brought forth, which utterly transforms our image of nature. And I think the, the purity of either materialism or deep ecology doesn't give us this embeddedness. So I look to biological narratives that really embed culture in, uh, in ecology. So I don't accept the, um, the usual conventional notion of, uh, of deep ecology. Now, in the process of the enfoldment of these cultural ecologies uh, over time, I prefer, again, in the shift of language, to use natural drift rather than adaptation. Uh, adaptation tends to give the idea that the organism is clamped into a niche, and the niche is objectively real. It's nature. And it's basically saying, survive or die, fit, adapt or die, fit or die. And it doesn't um, encourage the perceptions that actually a niche is a dialogue that's being brought forth, just to go back to my metaphor of the, the banks of the river and the water and the, and the wave dynamics. A niche is a collective body politic. It's a dialogue. It's an embeddedness of the organism plus the environment, to use Gregory Basin's phrase. It's a, it's a temporal flow, and it's a, it's, a, it's a collective body politic that's changing and moving through time so that individuals are climbing all over one another's backs and one another's niche, and one, one's pollution is another's uh, nutrition, and there isn't a sense that nature is saying do or die, adapt or die. It's moving through time with a kind of drift. And the phrase natural drift is from the Chilean biologist uh, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. So I like natural drift because it gives a sense that nature is more like the tectonic plates, and that if we see, especially living in California, that the tectonic plates are not crystalline and fixed, that they're actually a fluid dynamic motion on the surface of the planet, and they sort of are like foam on a glass of beer. They are definitely uh, not fixed and crystalline. So it's a movement through time. And as individuals in this natural drift move, every little change changes their natural history and brings forth a different kind of dialogue, a different form of collective body politic. And organisms are sculpting and creating their niche as much as they're being constrained to adapt or die. So the whole notion of adaptation, uh, like deep ecology, I just want to throw it out the window. So I see it as more a kind of temporal flow that's coevolutionary. And a good example of this would be bees in ultraviolet light and flowers. Bees uh, see stripes on the flowers that we can't see. Therefore, they pollinate those flowers. Therefore, the ones that have more ultraviolet stripes are the ones that get pollinated that uh, are part of this dialogue that goes on through time. So there's a, there's in a natural drift and a shift in the ultraviolet spectrum where sensitivity to ultraviolet light and bees and flowers begin to create this whole dance through time that isn't necessarily one of just adaptation or, or die. It's co-evolutionary emergence. So there's a kind of wonderful structural coupling between the organism and the environment. So you have uh, a sense in which uh, the, the mind, rather than being kind of epiphenomenal, is actually emerging and is part of this evolutionary sequence that I described in the, in the, lectures on, in the lecture on bacteria last time. And that the, uh, the critter, whether it's a, a blue-green algae or a cyanobacteria, is enormously powerful in, in changing its environment. So that if the bacteria begin to uh, respond to light and excrete oxygen, then suddenly the whole world that had existed before in the methane atmosphere begins to change. And the whole world in which the sky was brown and the ocean smelled like asparagus piss, all of that suddenly changes as blue-green bacteria come in and suddenly we get our lovely blue sky and we get a very different kind of world that's brought forth. Well, these critters are about the smallest critters you can possibly imagine. So their capacity to sculpt the planet and to begin to uh, affect the albedo and to affect the atmosphere and to affect the, the, the amount of rainfall and the pressure of the ocean on the tectonic plates creating volcanic eruption affecting the cloud cycle, affecting the albedo. All of these things are so wonderfully uh, involved with one another that the simple notions of, of do or die or Darwinian survival or that uh, evolution is strictly a, a question of the competition of males sticking their genes in females 
and that this is all uh, what it's about. Those are narratives of late capitalism, but I don't think they're really the narratives of, uh, of how biology works and what uh, biology is more you know, inspiring of these complex dynamics. So the environment actually is a temporal flow, not a, not a container. And the planet is not a container in which there's just this thin film of scum on life, of called life, floating on it. The, the planet is itself this kind of dynamic concert in time of this collective body politic that one wants to call Gaia. Gaia, in a sense, is like the immune system of the planet. It's a form of naming the, the quality of life on this planet. It's a form of stabilizing it through time. And it's a, it's a way of protecting, say, for example, its relationship to temperature so that the conditions for self-organization and continuity uh, continue. Now, in, my, in the movie I showed you last time, the video, uh, I tr showed you examples of self-organization from noise at the most primitive level, and where one can see that rather than the old notions that organization was something that was bizarre, uh, weird, something imposed, uh, organization actually comes in fairly early, and that order is available for free in the universe, to use kind of Stuart Kaufman's language. Notice if we begin to use these the, the, this new language, notice how all of these phrases echo with different, um, different visions of a possible polity. If you envision uh, that life is do or die, it's competition among dominant males for sticking their genes in females, that the nature is just uh, this, this uh, container, and that the, the whole notion of, the, uh, of life and consciousness is just epiphenomenal, then you develop a whole image of society and politics that derive from that that are quite different than if you use the language of coevolution, uh, symbiotic, uh, endosymbionts, natural drift, temporal flow, the niche as a collective body politic, the environment as a kind of concert or ensemble. All of that language brings forth a very different aesthetic perception of what the valuation of life is and what the dynamics of life is on the planet. So these, these, these languages are deeply wed to the sociology of knowledge of, of our time. And of course, in, the, uh, in, in both Huxley and Darwin, they're very, very much involved with the narratives of the economies of, uh, of capitalism and sociobiology of late capitalism. So once we begin to see that organization is available for free, <laughs> notice what a kind of revolutionary notion that is. What would be the economic implications of self-organization from noise and order available for free? Uh, these ideas haven't yet uh, really impacted with our politics, but I do think that this is precisely what's going to happen with the politics of the next century, that the, this new biology is beginning to uh, demand kind of reconceptualization. Now, if, um, if culture is deeply embedded in nature, then we don't want to just uh, talk about nature. We want to talk about the, the codependent origination, to use the Buddhist phrase, of cultural ecologies. And when we move from, say, spirochete to spinal cord and move up to the, the, the hominid narratives of evolution, then we see that there have been a succession of ecolo cultural ecologies that have brought forth different kinds of, of responses and in concert of the organism in the, uh, in the ecology. The first, of course, is the classical one of the forest. And this would be basically <coughs> a compressive environment rather than an expansive environment. And this would be basically the mammalian environment in which the, the sensorium of uh, smell and olfaction and oral uh, auditory hearing and the kind of light sensing pineal gland, all of these begin to get laid down. Uh, but the, the mammalian <coughs> story, as Brian Swim has described in, in his book, The Universe Story, is very much a response <coughs> uh, to catastrophe. That in self-organization from noise, noise and catastrophes, rather than being disasters, sometimes are, as the Chinese would say, crisis and opportunity. So in the, in the, in the um, anaerobic catastrophe, it changed the atmosphere from methane to oxygen, but that made uh, the possibilities of respiration and metabolism and sexual reproduction uh, possible for this large colossus of the nucleated cell. And so the whole dynamics of learning how to deal with those atmospherics changed the whole narratives of evolution and gave us a kind of acceleration of time that we call sex. Sex is one way of speeding up time and making sure that the offsprings are different. They're not just clones of what came before. So sex is